Well, here we go with yet another podcast or the Ivan and James Martin show, as it says on the credits. So, James Martin, Ivan Martin, and our guest on this occasion, Aidan Murta, who is having an amazing renaissance with his band, Protex. I knew them in their original form way back in the very late 70s. And here they are all these years later doing possibly better now than they ever did when they were signed to a major record company. Uh, There was a bit of a hiatus in the middle and Aidan will tell us all about that as we chat. You're very welcome. Thanks very much. Uh, It's good to do this with you again. And uh, way back in the day when Protex were formed, actually, I had a record shop called Sounds Around in Belfast. And you guys used to come there after school. (laughs) And it seemed like one minute... You were coming in, dumping your bags under the album browsers, and uh, two minutes later, you were signed by Polydor, and off you went to London. Now, I'm sure the timeline was longer than that, but what are your memories of them? Well, I remember sounds around vividly. I remember coming down and getting all the pick sleeves and the coloured vinyl. Um, you would always have them first in the city, I think. Um, so I have great memories of that and of the other guys in the band who haven't, the original band who I haven't seen for a while, like Paul and Dave and Owen. So, yeah, it was early days and we were just sort of coming together and getting to know sort of musically each other. Yeah, and then, of course, Good Vibes came along and we recorded Don't Ring Me Up, and that sort of took us further. So, Yeah, I was looking at that online the other day, and I'd forgotten that it actually... I was expecting it to be a good vibration. Certainly the yeah. seven-inch vinyl I have is good vibrations. Yeah. But it was rough trade... It was, it was licensed to rough trade to meet demand at the time. Um, because, yeah, it started selling and started getting a lot of airplay. And um, we did the John Peel session. Um, we, I think we did about four or five songs. And just before the Easter holidays, when we were at school doing our A-levels, and we went over to Maida Vale and recorded there. So that was a great experience at the time. But, yeah, we got our play after that, uh, after John Peel played us. Um, and that created a lot of interest, I think, and the major labels, um, sort of their ears parked up, and yeah, Polydor eventually came over. Plus, there was a few other big majors came over as well, um, and Belfast, of course, at that time there's interest in new music as well. So, after the undertones got signed, and yeah, the there's a lot happening. You know. Were a real tour de force, weren't yeah. they? Yeah, yeah. I mean. That I remember them coming up and recording Teenage Kicks at Downtown. Brilliant, yeah. And I'm thinking, like, wow, yeah. these guys could just, you know, they had song after song, and they were so commercial. But they were local, but it translated. Yeah. Like, I've got a cousin called Kevin, <laughs> you know, and yeah. off it went. Uh, but there were other bands, I was thinking. There were so many other the outcasts, bands. Of yeah. course. The Outcast, Rudy, uh-huh. um, Shock Treatment. Yeah, um, Extremists. The Extremists, yeah. And what Bank did you robbers. call the wee band? Uh, the Tear Jerkers. The Tear Jerkers, Another yeah. Murder Mystery. That's right, yeah. That there were, were so many bands. Yeah, and there were loads of them playing yeah. in different venues. You, did you do your first gig in a church hall, is that right? Yes, we did. Um, Dave got us that gig um, up in the Methodist Church Hall. It was a youth club. 
Right. And that was the very first one. In yeah. Knock, or In she... Knock, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Our very first. It was and fun, yeah. You know, how come I can remember <laughs> that you played in Knock Methodist Church Hall in 1978 I I or wherever it is? I and I couldn't remember what I had for my <laughs> dinner last Thursday. I know, I know. You know, it's crazy, isn't it? But later we um, we did a, a mini tour of youth clubs, I remember, just to start gigging. Yeah. Um, and one of those was Cosmos Youth Club over in the West, um, in Hill Hall at the time. Yeah. And my dear wife was a, went to that youth club. Really? Yes. Wow. Absolutely. It's a small world, isn't it? Yeah, it yeah. is. Crazy. And John Davis filmed that, of course, in his Shell Shock Rock. He didn't film us. Yeah. But he filmed the youth club and everything. Yeah. And the guys getting into the punk thing. and Yeah. Very interesting times. Amazing yeah. times. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it just then got better. You went across to Polydor. Yeah. And you were very fortunate, although you didn't think it at the time, mm -hmm. in the record company, the person they sort of gave you to mentor you and look after you was Charles Chandler. Charles, yes, yes. Who had been in the animals. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. who had, had like number one, House of the Rising Sun, yeah. here and in America. And I mean, the animals were a big deal. Animals were a great band, big yeah. deal, very successful. And Charles, like, yeah, you're right at the time, we didn't really appreciate sort of, Enormity, of, you know, yeah, because um, he discovered Hendrix and managed Hendrix for yeah, a good while. That's Slade right. as well. He yeah. went on. He he brought them on. Produced all their records. Um. So yeah, he had a lot going there, and that came about really through a guy called Alan Black. Do you remember Alan Black? He worked in Polydor. He was the A and R guy who yeah. signed us. Yes. And me and Alan were having a, a discussion about music, and about what we used to listen to. Uh, you know before we got signed and all. And I used to say that myself and Owen, the drummer, were really big Slade and T-Rex fans. I said, who would you like to sound like? And I said, I'd love to sound like Slade and blah, blah, blah. So that's when the Chaz Chandler thought came in Down's head. Yeah. And then he brought Chaz down to Chessington, where we were living at the time, in the old Boomtown Rats house, actually. Mm -hmm. And we met Chaz and uh, we spent an evening and talked music. Yeah, and then we started the album, so that was good. We had already been in Rack Studios, though, Mickey Moses' place, right, uh, just before that with another producer called John Jones, but we really weren't happy with the stuff that was coming out then, that was being put together. Yeah. It, the great thing about that version of Protex mm -hmm. was it was all about the energy yeah. of it. And... Charles understood that. He did. Whereas Mickey Most's organization, Rack, understood. Sanitized. Yeah. How, they did, but yeah, yeah. they knew how to get hits. They had countless yeah. hits. You know, with another label, Hot Chocolate might have had four or five hits. With Rack, the 25, yeah. you know, it just went on Very and successful. on. So Chaz was the man. Chaz was the man, guys. yeah. Yeah. And I give yeah. you three words. Mm -hmm. Learn your craft. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, that's what he that was his mantra every morning. Yeah. And it was uh yeah, he used to refer to Jimi Hendrix and Jimmy practiced eight hours a day. That's mm -hmm. what you have to do and all this stuff. So he had this regime in his head too, and like he had us in the studio. When we were in Rack Studios, we had very late night sessions and rock and roll, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Like we were finishing maybe three in the morning and driving back to Chessington, coming in maybe two in the afternoon, whatever, living the rock and roll lifestyle. Yeah. Then Charles came along and says, right, you're going to be working nine to five, because it suited him too. Yeah. Um, discipline. So he was all about that in, mm. in music, learning your craft, etc. Yeah. And uh, on reflection, do you think he was right? On reflection, he didn't understand the whole new wave punk thing. 
that we sort of believed in and yeah. still do. Um, he understood the raw energy. Yeah. Um, but I didn't think he got the whole protest thing the way maybe other people would, you know. It's so, mm -hmm. so the way you would have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's actually, that's maybe coming through because I'm hardly <laughs> letting you get a word in edgeways. <laughs> it's fine. Don't be worrying. I'm here for the crack. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we were talking about America. Yeah. What was that feeling like when you go over with your band and perform? Was it great? Fantastic, James, yeah. I mean, the first time we went over, we went over sort of, because our American, our manager was American mm -hmm. way back in 1979, and she brought us over kind of to, to look around, really. Um, so we were in awe, like being in New York and everything was totally alien to us, you know, it was like being on another planet. So then we came back and we did St. Patrick's Day gig in a, a really big, high profile club at the time called Haraz. Um and we were eighteen at the time and and that was just amazing. It was great fun. And John T. Davis, the independent filmmaker who lives in Hollywood, mm -hmm. um, who did Shell Shock Rock, he was in town and he came along and he filmed us. So you can see that on YouTube now and it's I often look back on it. And a lot of promoters would kind of connect that YouTube video and put it up on social media as well. So it's, it was a great time for us. But what's that feeling like when you guys went on to you? Was that feeling really nice to have? Or was it just go and have fun with the lads and play some music? It was a bit of both, really, yeah. It was very much like this is what we're doing. This is, this is you know, how we live. It was very much that, and it was as much of the rock and roll lifestyle that we could grab at the time, being 18 to 22 or whatever, you know. We did all the things that you're supposed to do, or tried to anyway. And, um, yeah, travelling was great. We enjoyed every bit of it, you know. So, And, um, yeah, I mean, each gig that you did, it was like, that was your moment, so you give it everything. Always very energetic. Um now you were, I've been to America more times with the new version of Protex than I, I did in the past, obviously. So. What was that, um, that experience like when you meet uh, all different kinds of bands? What was your favourite one from that gig? Not just from America, but different places, you know, really? Well... In the in the old in the seventies, going back or recently in the seventies, yeah, from, from the seventies to now. Well, I suppose um, the bands in those days that I would have liked in America, and particularly New York, where we were, we spent most of our time would have been Johnny Thunders and the Heartbreakers, mm -hmm. um, ex New York Dolls, um, the Ramones. We would have liked. Um, in fact, when we were playing Haraz, I was just came. This came back to me after uh, thinking about this uh, interview, I remember singing Don't Ring Me Up or whatever at Haraz and in the booth directly across with me, from me was Dee Dee Ramone. And it was like just a normal night for him out. And I thought, right, there's a the guy from the Ramones. And then afterwards in the dressing room when the gig was over, Owen and all was like, where's your man from the Ramones? My biggest regret now at this stage is we didn't go over and say, hello, how are you? You know, it was all... We were too cool to do that, you know. What was I mean? it like too cool for school type it thing? Was wasn't certain. It? Yeah, 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 it's not. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, I liked all those bands. Um, I remember we did a gig uh, in 1980 with Split Ends. Remember them? Yeah, they went on to Crowded New House. Zealand yeah, band, yeah. weren't they? We played Long Island with them, supported yeah. them. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. I mean, when you went over to Polydor, I mean, I suppose in the Polydor building or in the office, the big act were the jam. Yeah, that's right. Well, Polydor had a lot of interesting bands at the time. And then Roxy music as well. Yeah, they had Roxy music. Yeah. And uh, Roxy had just sort of released a, almost like a comeback album. Yeah. Uh, they had the jam. I think they had Susie and the Banshees. They did. Um, yeah. 
And also linked to part of that building was Chrysalis. Remember Chrysalis? Yes, I do. So you'd walk into the reception area and like Susie Sue would be there or Pauline Black would have been there. Yeah. Um, you'd be walking along the corridor. In fact, what happened, uh, a memory I have is walking along the corridor and uh, Paul Weller came up this um, said, oh, here you, 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 your vinyl's ready. So we had a copy of uh, I Can Only Dream and he took it from us and brought us down to a listening room and um, put it on and listened to the A and the B side. And um, yeah, thinking now, he was 21 and like we were 18, you know, long time ago. He, but you met all those people, you know. You know, some people have made music and they're, you know, in the moment and... But Paul Weller was always going to be an artist with yeah. longevity, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there was more to him. Yeah. Yeah, there was more to him than just a, a thrash. He, <laughs> I saw him in the Royal Albert Hall about three years ago, and he was just so good. Yeah. And uh, Suzanne, who was... A wee mod in her day yeah. and had a, you know, the uh, dress that Debbie Harry wore on parallel lines, yeah. sort of black and white, uh, all that sort of gear back Great. in the day, you know. <laughs> but uh, when we went to see Paul Weller, she knew obviously all the jam stuff yeah. and uh, he did a few of those. And uh, but then she started going, did he do that? Is it is that? That, yeah. that was style council. Yeah, yeah. Oh, right, right. No, yeah, no, not so low that you know, and so it went. Was there a sense of community around Polydor? Was it just you're through the door, you're signed, you're one of the gang, or was it mega competitive? I never saw any competitiveness, no. It was just somewhere that um, you recorded and they, it was the machine. Yeah. And there was a, a department that designed covers, you know. Uh, do you remember the vinyl covers? That, yeah. yeah. Um, so there was that sort of thing. There was in another department, marketing. It was very corporate. Um, so. And, and Kirsty McCall was quite friendly with you guys, wasn't she? Kirsty was, God love her, yeah, she was indeed. Um, yeah, we used to hang out quite a bit. Yeah, and she would have been about your age as well. She was our time. age, yeah. yeah. She was came to the, our Chessington house quite a bit. Um, she had expressed an interest in doing some of our stuff, yeah. covering some of our stuff. Yeah. Um, she was a great artist, you know. She great. was. She was fantastic. And uh, an exciting time. They say never meet your heroes, yeah. <laughs> but you have obviously met many of yours. And uh, yeah. do you feel the better for it? To be honest, I do. I would have to say so. Um, I remember sort of just pre punk, I must have been about 16 or 17, going to see Dr. Feelgood, the original Dr. Feelgood. Yeah. Wilco Johnson, uh -huh. in the Whitla Hall. Yes, I was there. Were you there too? A fabulous gig. And then yeah. they came back and they did the Ulster Hall a few yeah. times, I think. But that very first, it was their first time over and uh, it was just incredible. And that really made up my mind. I really got, I love the bliss music stuff. Um, love to be a musician. But maybe two, two or three years later, I was, Protex were opening in the Marquee Club for Wilco, the Wilco mm -hmm. Johnson band then. Yes. So it was great just speaking to him and, you know. It's funny you about. mention them because yesterday, and try this out at home just to get a wry smile, and, you know, if Alexa, you ask yes. for something and then she speaks it back to you. Yes. So I'm going, Alexa, play She's a Wind-Up, yes. Dr. Feelgood, and it comes back as Dr. Feelgood. She's a wind up, <laughs> you know. Brilliant. At, uh, but great times, great bands. But it all sort of came to an end, or so it seemed. Yeah. And what age were you then? 
Um, let me think. I probably would have been about twenty or so. Yeah, just about mm-hmm. twenty. Or yeah. Um. Yes, that that's right because we didn't. We heard that we were on tour shortly. Shortly after the Boomtown Rats tour that we did, we got yeah. sent the tapes, um, of the stuff that we had done with Chaz, and we thought we could be do- that doesn't sound right. We could do better, and so we were the band wasn't happy at all with again with what we had produced, and Polydor weren't particularly happy, and the the contract wasn't extended, so that was the spiral, and yeah. that was kind of it, and then we we did hang around London and we did play etc. But and then the whole music, the mo- the new romantics were coming in, and uh, there's a lot of skinhead stuff. Uh, there wasn't so much mo- of the poppy, power pop, punk stuff that we were doing. Yeah. And then one day Dave decided, you know what, I'm calling it a day and going home. Yeah. And then I kind of followed that. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of the end, yeah. So it, we did so much in like such a short time, I think. You did. And then... Owen came home as well. Yeah. And if, I remember meeting him and he was working in an estate agent. That's right, and he was. If ever somebody didn't need to be, it was Owen. Yeah. God yeah. bless him, he yeah. hated it. Yeah. And he got into the BBC yeah. and he worked his way up and he was a producer. And years later, when Sean Crummy and I... Yeah. Did the folks on the hill? Owen was the producer, and that yeah. was a nice, that was great, time, yeah. calm round thing. But, uh, what did Bader do? What did he do? Yeah, um, he well, he decided to uh to come home. He was the first, he decided that was enough, sort of thing. Um, and at the time, he was probably right. Mm. Um, it was pro- that version of Protex had come to an end. So he came home. I think that he went to the old Rupert Stanley or College of yeah. Biz yeah. and was going to redo A levels. Right. But was also applying for jobs and got a job in the bank and mm. was in the bank for years and years. Right. Um, he retired maybe 10 years ago, I think. So. And. Uh, Max, as I always called him. Max, Paul yeah. Maxwell. Him and Ray, did we remember Ray? He, yeah. He came with Bader's us, yeah. cousin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, <laughs> Max, then has done well with he the has. merchandising company that he has. He's worked hard on it. Crew issue, and he's still rolling along. Um, he does the merch for uh, Niall Rogers, amongst others. Yeah. And when Nile Rogers was on in Belfast, he rang me and we went down and met him. And the next thing, That's right. you were on the stage saying... There you go, James. Well, well I, I had no choice. That's but brilliant. no, um, it, it was actually a really nice feeling just to go up with, of course, the like the main man. But also, I, I'm sure it's the same thing as when you have backup dancers or singers... I'm sure that your band was just kicking off really well. Yeah, yeah, it's a great feeling, sort of the, the music and the energy and everything happening. So the music took a back seat for a while, uh, like a long time. Would it have been the best part of 20 years? Maybe a bit, for me, maybe a bit more. Right. I know that in the early days when the three of us came back, I know that Dave um, formed a band with right Paul Fraser and that those yeah. guys um, but I didn't play me and I, I did a few sessions might have done one gig with them but I stayed away from music for a long time um, just went got a career family and yeah yeah and just concentrated and it, on that really and just got a different life for a long time was it about 2011, 12, that sort of time, that you decided to dip your toe in the water again? Yeah, well, I did have a band. Yes, it was around that time. I can't remember the exact year. Yeah. Um, But I did have a band called Rumble Mambo. We did a few gigs about the time, just... Yeah. Um, Which were... It was almost like a Dr. Feelgood tribute band, but... Yeah. We never called it that, but no. it was with that, and we did a few clash numbers. Um, great fun, um, really good fun, 
And then there was another band I played with. We didn't gig much, but we recorded called The Greeters. Right. K- Casey Peters. She's a fantastic drummer, more jazz yeah. oriented, yeah. actually. And um, I remember playing some of The Greeters stuff on yeah. the radio. Do you? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. You sent it to me. It was an yeah. interesting vinyl. That's right. It was a. a it wasn't a seven inch or a twelve inch. It was sort of somewhere in between. In between, yeah, yeah. yeah. But the greeters, I remember... a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun with both bands. Uh-huh. Um, and then yeah, then what happened was Dave actually rung me up, and I hadn't seen or heard from Dave in years. Yeah, and it was great to hear from him. Yeah, and uh, he said, "I hear, hear that you're playing again." I said, "Yeah." Um, he says, "Do you fancy you know maybe getting Protex back together?" And I says, "No." Not really, and at that time I didn't. Um, plus, what was happening as well was that Sing Sing Records, who are an independent label in New York, Brooklyn, yeah, um, they got hold of Strange Obsessions and released that on vinyl, mm-hmm. and that was generating a lot of interest because now you had the internet and social media and everything. Yeah, um, so there was a, a small group of vinyl enthusiasts were buying this yeah and um there was interest going on there um so i said to dave no i'm not really interested but after a few months the stuff that i was doing had come to an end with the other band and um we met up and also i was working in Le Mans hotel at the time yeah um and i was booking bands for cabarets um you know, you'd do maybe 300 a night or something and you'd have Glam Slam on or you'd James Hushon and uh, yeah. it was good, it was fun. Um, but was Johnny Hero actually said to me, would you not put Protex together? And he got me thinking too. And his drummer was a guy, Gordy Walker. Gordy and, Walker, uh, yeah. So myself and Dave got together with Gordy and um, it was such good fun just in the rehearsal room playing all those songs again. And what kind of hit home to me was... Um, how good the pop, the, all the songs were, you know, the pop feeling of playing and everything was yeah. good. There were good songs. Yeah. And um, yeah, that's that's what happened. And so it carried on and you've had a more or less settled lineup now for a few yeah. years, haven't you? Yeah. Gordy's there, isn't he? Gordy's the there and Norman Boyd's there and John Rossi's on bass. Yeah. So our first gig as that band um, was, well, Dave was with us at that time, um, was um, the opening of Good Vibrations uh, film. Yes. We, uh, the, we played after that and the Black Box. Right. And then after that, we got um, a gig in the Punk Festival in Blackpool. Um, and after that, um, the lineup changed because Dave... But no, the uh, Andrew, the bass player, had left, and John Rossi came in. Um, but we had gone to Japan, and we did two gigs out in Japan, which was recorded and released in 1977 records. So that was a great experience, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. yeah. And you've played locally, you've played in Japan, you've played around Europe, and you've been back to play in America and yeah. are shortly going back again for an American tour. Yes, that's correct. So tell We're us heading out that. there in March. Well, we went back to America with the current band. We were invited over there actually to the South by Southwest Festival. Yes. And it was great to get an invite because usually you have to apply and go through the red tape and everything. But we had a promoter in a club out there um, who brought us over. Um, so that was just incredible for us. And we, it was a pretty big audience. It's a big audience. festival. Yeah, we, yeah, so that was a great experience for us. Um, and we did the South by Southwest Festival maybe three times or four times um, after that. But one of the times it was out there, there was a guy came back after the gig and he said, listen, that was fantastic and thanks very much says what about doing some new stuff and i actually hadn't thought about doing new stuff because it was having such a good time playing all the old songs 
So that brought the whole thing in another dimension because these, and then a few other people had come up and said, any new stuff? So there was a demand or an interest for this. And this wasn't people our age, this was a younger audience. And when I say younger, it's usually, it would usually ours would be between 25 and maybe 40. Yeah. Um, we're slightly older than that. Um, so yeah, that's got me thinking, right, maybe you should try and do some new stuff. So I started writing more songs. Um, but I was careful to be in the same vein as the earlier stuff, you know. Um, and not introduce saxophones and pianos or yeah, anything like yeah. that. Um, so we did and recorded um, the Tightrope album, which was re released in 2017. So that was a great experience too. Um, and also we re released Wicked Ways, our current album, in 2020. So we're going out to promote it again in uh, March. So we're doing, I think it's nine dates. Starting off in Brooklyn, New York, um, and ending in Memphis. We've never been to Memphis, so oh, it's great. Yeah, so yeah. you'll love it. So I believe. Yeah. So I believe. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, gonna have fun. So. And um, what was your favorite song to play for the audience? Um, it's one of the newer. So I do like playing the old stuff, and I think the two most popular ones would be "Don't Ring Me Up," obviously, and "Strange Obsessions." Those two songs. Mm. But there's a song called Shining Star, which is off the Tightrope album, which I quite like playing. It's, that would be my favourite one. Uh, I used to like it when you would play some T-Rex. Yeah, Jeepster like Jeepster. stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We do that the odd time, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, I'd be afraid of turning into Glam Slam recording. <laughs> <laughs> so it's looking good. And I, did I see that you've been signed up to do a St. Paddy's weekend? Yes, then? yes, that's another offer we got at St. Patrick's Day Festival. We're headlining in Hackney in, right. in London. So yeah. always good to play London, always good to go to London. Yeah. Uh, so looking forward to that. Um, yeah. And, and what was your favourite festival to play in within your band? Was it a, a nice feeling when you get asked to play in any festivals? Not just the ones here, but the ones over in America? It's fantastic. I mean, it's, a, it's an honour to be asked to play anywhere, I think, you know. Um, it's, it's just a nice feeling, as you say, and... Uh, you just don't want to let people down. You want to give it your best, and, and you also want to enjoy it. So, yeah. But I, I like to play in the um, South by Southwest festival. We also did a really good festival called Flamingo Beach a few years ago in um, Almeria in Spain. It was enjoyable. So uh, a lot of Spanish bands, and we did the first festival, and I think next month or something, there's a fourth edition of that festival happening. We're not playing that one. But that was a good one to play, the first one. So, yeah. so the message is uh, pro tax is alive and kicking. Yes, indeed. <laughs> indeed. Yeah, well, look, it's been great talking to you, Kenny. Oh, uh, we've enjoyed it, haven't we? Yes, I, I was actually enjoying the quack yeah, and uh, all, the, all the, those experiences. Yeah. And you enjoyed it when I showed you up on uh, YouTube, yeah. uh, the original band clan, didn't you? Yes, uh, one final thing, you imagine about my dad's shop, yeah. when you walked in that time, leaving your stuff down, what was that feeling like when you actually first met my dad, man? Well, it was great because he had so many good records, <laughs> you know <laughs> what I mean, and uh, it was good times, good times and a good Good place to be going to, you know. I remember from that time one final thing that Elvis Costello was playing in the Ulster Hall, yes, and we went down, and you boys had picture discs and all that you'd <laughs> got from me, and you said, Would you mind signing? Sure, sure, and you handed him this, and he goes. My God, yeah. where did you get <laughs> this from? <laughs> I want the copy. Yeah, that was yeah. good. Listen, you've had a lot of fun along the way. It's still happening. And uh, Aidan Murder, it's been a pleasure. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.